Okay, tonight we are going to go into more detail about the process of westernization in Russia, uh, especially under the leadership of Peter and Catherine the Great. So um, you can number these notes number 27, title them Russian Westernization, etc. Okay, this is a refresher. You've seen this. Peter the Great is the son of Alexis Romanov. He travels uh, as a young man undercover throughout Western Europe and, and sees the manufacturing, the arts, the architecture, the libraries, the government structure, the democracy or democratic uh, leanings that Western Europe has. He learns about the Enlightenment, etc. Um, and he sees that this is so different from Russia and in ways how it's better than what Russia is doing. So this is just a reminder, if you were this new charismatic Russian leader, uh, Peter the Great, um, and you saw the effects of the Renaissance, the Scientific Revolution, the Columbian Exchange, uh, and the Enlightenment, what would you do when you took power? So Peter the Great. He is the czar from 1689 to 1725, um, and he implements major social, uh, but also economic, and kind of, but not many, very much political shifts in Russia. Uh, he enlarges and modernizes the military, so he makes it look much more like Western Europe. He creates a hierarchy. This didn't exist in Russia before, where you have generals and lieutenants and colonels, and then your privates, etc. Um, he gets new technologies from Western Europe, mainly like gunpowder, but a, a better, uh, more efficient, better working, functioning. <clears throat> he reforms the educational system. Uh, don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that the majority of Russians can now read and write, uh, but it does mean that a certain class or a number of Russians can go to technical schools and learn trades, as in not just agriculture. Um, because now as they're increasing their technology, they find a need for new jobs. Somebody has to make these guns and make um, these items in factories. And so these people go and get technical degrees, not necessarily like a university like we have today, but it's an education nonetheless. Um, he creates new manufacturing, which again, remember, means making raw materials into a finished good through uh, like man-made crafting. Uh, he conscripts entire towns to work on production. He says, you guys are all going to make um, guns and you guys are all going to make railroads later, but uh, nonetheless. He changes the style of dress and cuts off the beards, which you saw in the video, and implements a beard tax. If you wish to keep your beard, you have to pay. Um, and so all this is called westernization. I hope you have uh, westernization under Peter the Great as the main idea in your Cornell notes. Here's an image. This was on the AP test a few years ago of a boyar getting his beard cut off. One thing that's important to note is that a lot of these changes only happen with the upper class. The lower class primarily stays as serfs on the farms and doesn't even really know about what's going on. Um, again, the upper class has the time and the money to change, so they're the ones mostly affected by this Western. So more on Peter the Great. He strengthens the business class, creates more of a commercial trade uh, economy. Uh, he weakened and exploited the serfs because now he needs people to work in factories, etc. And so there's more forced labor. Uh, heavy taxes continue. There's no free market, as in serfs don't have social mobility. They have no way to improve their lives. Uh, working conditions in, in the manufacturing industry are very rough. A lot of times they'd wake up, work in the factory all day, in dangerous conditions where machines could cut off their fingers, etc. And then sometimes even end up like sleeping under their workspace at night because they had to wake up so soon and work again. And they didn't, they didn't want to pay taxes on their home, etc. So this does not greatly improve the lives of the lower class. The Orthodox Church is still under state control. That's a continuity <clears throat> that Peter the Great still is in charge of the church as a ruler. Um, Peter the Great wages wars with Sweden to expand his borders. Um, he specifically wants to get St. Petersburg as his window to the west. Um, and we'll talk more about why that is. It's a little bit far north for his goals, but uh, it starts... It's a step in the right direction, St. Petersburg, as far as getting a port city. 
Um, after several setbacks, he's, he's seen as an enlightened despot. So a despot is sort of a tyrannical uh, authoritarian ruler, but in, he's enlightened. So he's trying to implement these changes whole scale, but he might have to be uh, pretty brutal to do that. So he's not, you know, the perfect leader, but it's a, it's a shift in the right direction after Ivan IV, for example, or Alexis Romanov sending hordes of people to Siberia. Westernization continued. Um, so Peter works to make Russia a bit more like Europe, and this is called Westernization. However, it's really important when we talk about Westernization that we know that this is selective Westernization. Um, he is not bringing every aspect of Europe. He's choosing, picking and choosing, and being selective about what he brings. So he's not bringing democratic reforms like the Magna Carta. He has no aspirations to mimic Britain's parliamentary monarchy where there's a parliament that helps make decisions. He doesn't want to change the government. He wants to keep his power. Um, so he doesn't afford free speech or democracy, etc. Um, he doesn't shift his economy towards an export economy like the mercantilism that's happening in Spain and Portugal and soon to be Britain and France. So he's not saying we're going to mass produce goods and send them elsewhere to make money. He has plenty of his own people that, that have needs on his hands. But he does use his manufacturing to improve the lives and the internal economy of his country. So again, the changes don't happen for the lower class, the ordinary Russian people, mostly just for the boyars and the upper class. Think about why this is. Go ahead and make a, an, a guess in your notes. Um, and then it's important to note that the changes happen for westernization did have some resistance with the boyars. They didn't want to be told, you know, the way things are happening in Spain is better. The way things that are happening in France are better than here. Um, and they didn't want to have to pay a beard tax, etc. So think of it this way. If a U.S. president visited France, then came back and said, you know, we should be a bit more Frenchy. Um, we wouldn't like that many very much. Uh, we like to criticize the French, for example. Um, and really, does anyone like to give up power ever? No. So the boyars didn't like that they were being told what to do. It was undermining their power. People just don't like that. You might want to pause it. I'm going to go to the next slide if you're not done taking notes. Okay. So Catherine the Great, who is also a member of the Romanov family, and she's going to carry on many of the traditions of Peter. There she is. She's a bit of a minx. Um, she's actually well known for her uh, sexual exploits um, and <laughs> loud personality, but we'll get into that later. So after Peter the Great, there are a few decades of weak rulers, just really weak. We don't even we don't even want to mention them. They're not worth remembering. <laughs> and then we have Catherine. Um, so Peter the Third becomes czar in 1764, and he's married to Catherine, who's a German, and she's going to become more important. Uh, Peter the Third is a little bit impotent, and there's rumors that he might have had some very severe learning disabilities, perhaps. Um, and keep in mind, he and Catherine were not married for love, but for political reasons and arrangements. <clears throat> so, um, you're going to get this uh, clip in your email, and you need to watch the video and answer these questions, um, where you describe Catherine's rise to the throne. So, what exactly happened with Peter III, and how come he, he wasn't in power, and how come she was? Describe Catherine's relationship with Peter III, and describe her power struggle, okay? Um, so, make sure you do that, and watch till about uh, 1630, but I encourage you to watch the whole thing. Last couple notes um, about Catherine the Great. Uh, in 1762, she becomes empress, which is a czarina, not a czar. Um, so like Peter, her Peter the Great, I'm talking about, not Peter the Third, not her husband, um, she is a selective westernizer of Russia. She encourages Russian expansion. That's what she's really known for, is sending explorers down into Alaska, even coast of California through Canada. Um, she has uh, wages the Crimean Wars over the region of Crimea against the Ottoman Empire. She wants to gain a seaport to the Black Sea in the south. <clears throat> 
And she expands across the Bering Strait, which is what connects Russia and Alaska. Well, it's what's between Russia and Alaska, rather. Um, through modern-day Alaska, Canada, and down to California. And that was actually held by the Russians until the 1800s when um, Americans, or colonists, started to make, sorry, Americans started to make their way um, out west. Uh, here's a map for you. You can just get a picture of how big uh, Russia becomes by the 19th century, how much of it is conquered by, or uh, occupied by Siberia, this big barren region. Um, and you can see the Bering Strait all the way to the right. And we have Korea is occupied by the Russians, lots of Manchuria, right up to the border of China, parts of Mongolia, etc. Also, sorry, I should point out um, all these different regions and how uh, different they are, diverse they are culturally and linguistically. So it's a huge, not very uniform um, culture. Okay, so um, here we have the capital city of Moscow and I just want you to take a look at some of the architecture and what's going on and what life looks like in Russia. Um, this is in 1801 and because we're about to talk about architecture and how um, the architecture of Russia was affected by westernization. So take a look, you'll notice um, some of those like almost like candy domes. Um, pretty unique and, and kind of remind me of Orthodox, Greek Orthodox and the Byzantine Empire, but definitely nothing like our Gothic architecture that's happening in Western Europe. Um, okay, so here we go into some architecture. You can just draw or write quick observations. Um, okay, so before Peter the Great, we're gonna go through, um, here we have, um, this was built, the bell tower built by Ivan the Great you might remember from the video, it's also where uh, Ivan the Terrible was throwing animals off the bell tower um, in his sadistic ways. If you look at the upper left-hand corner map, this is in Moscow. So this is from 1600. This is well before res westernization, right, the Ivans. Notice uh, the color, the domes, the style, is it symmetrical or not, etc. What does it make you think of? Then we have, this is just baffles me that I can't believe it's built by Ivan the Terrible, um, but it's St. Basil, Basil's Cathedral. Um, and it was built in 1556, so well before westernization, and it's one of my favorite cathedrals in the world, I think. Um, but make some observations in your notes. What do you notice? Why do I think that this is ironic or surprising, I, sp I suppose, um, that it was commissioned and, and funded and built by Ivan the Terrible? This is also in Moscow, right on the red square. <clears throat> and now we have, um, not in Russia, but in Europe, we have what's going on in Europe, the Western Europe architecture that Peter the Great would have seen when he traveled Europe. And this is known as, um, so this is the opera in Paris. Notice the, the ornate features, the dome, the columns, make me think of you know Greece, the symmetry, the geometric patterns of arches and squares, etc. And this is again in Western Europe. Um, then we have the French Institute in Paris, where again we have some columns, some symmetry, basic windows, a, a dome, a lot of gold, etc. Um, there's this like triangle above the doorway that comes to symbolize, it comes from Greek, uh, the Greek architecture, but it tends to be in government buildings. Then we have in Italy, um, the Trevi Fountain. Again, we have statuary, columns, symmetry, a lot of ornate detail, the colors notice, etc. And now when uh, Peter the Great starts to build in St. Petersburg, take a look at what he builds. Um, quickly think back to St. Basil's Cathedral um, and the bell tower from Ivan III and compare that with... Um, so this is Peter the Great's Winter Palace. The colors are still pretty Russian and the gold, but notice the columns, the windows, that same triangle feature above the doorways, etc. Um, then he has St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg. Notice the columns. The dome is gold, uh, much more similar to that French Institute in Paris, etc. 
So just a quick reminder. So Peter the Great is known for centralizing power, waging wars with Sweden because he wanted a warm water port. He wanted to be able to get his ships trading more than just a month a year because those northern ports froze too often. Um, but he never achieved it, unfortunately. And that is for tonight. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, enjoy the